Well, I think everyone's ready to go, so I will call the meeting to order. I see no one needing to be excused from the meeting, so we'll move on to the adoption of the September 24th minutes. Kelly? Kelly moves. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Call for post agenda items. Are there any post agenda items? I was just, um, oh, Brian. I was going to move the adoption of the agenda. Okay, adoption of the agenda. Brian moves. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. We'll just pause a moment here for question period and see if any of our public have anything for us. Susan, is there anyone that you see online or doing anything? Uh, I don't see any questions coming through online today, Molly. Okay. Thank you. Um, item seven, we'll move on to bylaws and uh, move to our planning and development staff. Good morning. Um, today I have a second and third reading for road closure bylaw 196920. It is an application to close the road allowances between the east half of 191612 and the west half of 201612, and also a portion of the road between the east half of, half of 20 and the west half of 211612. These lands are located in Division 2, approximately um, nine and a half kilometers south of Tilly, along the north side of the Bantry Number 1 Reservoir. The parcels on all sides of the road allowance are in the Agriculture Land Use District, and the adjacent lands are owned by um, Tates and Ranching, um, Scott and Julie, Julie Tates, and, and the Eastern Irrigation District. Um, the purpose of the road closure is that the lands um, are currently being incorporated into the irrigation farming operation. Um, this bylaw has received um, approval to proceed from Council on December 19th, 2019. Um, public hearing and first reading were held on May 21st, and we received Alberta transportation approval on September 10th. If second and third reading are given by council today, then a lease agreement as per our, uh, as per the county renewal policy will be finalized and uh, lease payment will, will be made for the, for the use of these lands. So it is um, recommended by staff that second and third reading be given to bylaw 1969-20 for the road closure and lease of these two portions of uh, road allowance. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, any questions for Maria? If not, we entertain a motion for second reading. Hubie moves. Sure. Opposed? Motion is carried. 
And for third and final reading, all in favor, opposed, motion is carried. Moving us on to the planning and development report, Maria. Um, okay, so um, it's kind of, it's been business as usual uh, in our department. Um, we had two home occupation permits approved in September, so it's great to see that some new businesses are, are happening in the county. Um, we've also had comparable numbers this year as compared to last year, which is positive in uh, this crazy year of 2020. Um, con construction permits have also um, been very comparable to previous years. Um, Journey Energy and JDS have done extensive work on their properties, so um, which, which is is positive and is bringing in some construction permit revenue. Um, and they're also doing things safely, so that's that's great news. Um, the one thing in September, um, the news from uh, the Alberta Utilities Commission that. Um, the Duchess Solar project application has been dropped. Um, the company is able to reapply um, if they if they feel they would like to do that. But for right now, um, that is no longer on the table for the AUC. So I think that kind of sums up our September. Um, if there's any questions. Brian. Thank you, uh, Reeve Douglas. Uh, Maria, in, uh, in your uh, development permits, it has two businesses there. The second one being that matchmaking business. So are we talking about uh, light your fire matches or uh, fiddler on the roof, make me a match? <laughs> fiddler on the roof, make me a match. Uh, we, yeah, uh, it's a... Uh, Matchmaking business who is running out of their home, but they will not be, they'll be taking their business elsewhere. Um, the, the owner of the company is just kind of doing the back end stuff at home. Um, so, yeah, hopefully there will be a lot of love happening in the county going forward. <laughs> well, there already is, except when you talk about certain issues. So, it, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, but anyways, that was sort of interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Lionel. Yeah, Maria. So the application for that solar farm was uh, was dropped. Just did you get any indication as to why that happened? Was there any particular reason for it? Because we've, we've had a lot of applications and very little moving forward. And that and what's going on. Um, from what I read on um, the correspondence on the AUC website, um, the AUC felt that it has been enough time now for the company to be able to um, consult with the affected parties and, and get all their ducks in a row and they just weren't using that time. So they um, they felt that, you know, it, it's, um, oh, <laughs> sorry, I lost my words. Um, given the length of time since the application with, was filed and the likelihood of an amendment to the current application that was provided to the AUC, they considered that it was best to close this application and then they can reapply, um, with, with a brand new application because it did sound like there was going to be significant amendments that were required. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, a motion to accept the planning and development report, Alec moves. Opposed. Motion is carried. 
We'll move on. Thank you, Maria. We'll move on to the regional quality management plan. And Stuart, looked like he was out and about this morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, these are different times, uh, sitting in my half time here. Uh, actually, uh, just outside of uh, uh, Reed Douglas's house there, I'm coming in for ah. <laughs> uh, Well, I hope there's no smoke in the yard or anything. <laughs> no, no smoke in the yard. As a matter of fact, I'm uh, at the Jam Air Hall uh, meeting with Chief Clausen this morning uh, to get that uh, new portable uh, fill station uh, hooked up and, and get my stuff uh, for my trailer uh, out of his rescue truck. So uh, I'm definitely uh, in your area. Uh, thank you very much for having me this morning, uh, and, and I'm here to talk about the quality management plan. Uh, when we met uh, last council, uh, it was requested that I go back and make uh, an amendment, and uh, the amendment was to show the definitions from uh, Group A to Group uh, E uh, of, of the inspections and what those facilities uh, um, uh, are, are. And uh, so I did that and I've resent it to you now. And uh, I think it lays out quite well uh, exactly which structure is to which uh, um, uh, group. And, uh, and the one that I want to make note of in, and I put it uh, in, a, in a different color, but uh, under the uh, group uh, C, uh, residential occupancies. Uh, I do not have any powers of designation to go any into any residential home or private dwelling without the owner's permission. So that would be the owner. Or another question I get a lot is I get a concern from a renter that wants me to come in and look uh, at their house. And uh, that's another one that I, I, I call the owner of the structure first to say that we have a concern from the renter and then go in. And typically when I tell the renter that it kind of stops right there, I think they're afraid that they're going to get in trouble because they were asking me to come in and do something. So, so I thought I'd put that clarification in group C. Um, having said that, it's all in there and uh, I think it's what you're looking for. So my recommendation is that uh, council uh, accept this uh, amended uh, um, proposal for the QMP. Questions or motion, Kelly? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Stuart, for that and um, let you know that I think this is very energetic and um, um, clear as to what areas that, that we're responsible for. Um, and uh, I, I will take your recommendation and make that motion to approve. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you, Stuart. Anything else? Uh, nope, nope. Nothing, uh, nothing from myself. So thank you very much for having me. So, Stuart, just while you're there, um, the portable fill unit for the fire department, I assume, is what you're talking about, that you're getting organized? Yes, that's uh, um, in, in, in GEM here. Uh, right now, for, for uh, the fire department to refill their SCBA bottles, they have to fill off of the rescue truck that they currently have. Um, that rescue truck, and, and I guess I can give you an update on that, um, I'm actually going tomorrow to Coldale to meet with uh, ITB uh, for uh, Bizano's medium duty rescue truck and uh, and Jem's light duty rescue truck is supposed to be in the phase where we're almost at a, a pre-paint inspection. Um, so the anticipation is that that truck is going to be here uh, mid-November. So I, in, in getting ready for that, I have the portable fill station here uh, for uh, the Dem Fire Hall, and I'm stealing some, um, some equipment out of the rescue truck to put into my portable CBA. Uh, we're calling it the portable emergency response unit um, so that uh, I can fill these fill stations as we go. And uh, this timing is actually really perfect because I got a phone call from Rosemary uh, just on uh, Monday that uh, their CBA bottles are empty from doing practices. So uh, I need to have the system up and going to fill them up. And I'm gonna do that on my way home. 
uh, this afternoon. So that's where that's at right now. Thanks, Stuart. It's always sort of nice to hear about what's happening out there with the, our fire departments. So good. Well, For sure. have a good day. Okay, thank you. And and just one more quick thing is uh, uh, the uh, the rapid response or brush buggy that uh, TCB is building. Uh, I actually met with them on Monday, and this is one is for Bizano. And the anticipation that that truck is going to be 100% ready for my uh, mutual aid meeting with the fire chiefs on the 19th. So I'm going to have it at the Brooks Fire Hall, show it off to all the fire chiefs, and uh, Chief uh, Cochran there will be able to take his fire truck home to Bizano after that meeting. So hopefully that's all done. I met with them on uh, things like light package, where the siren is going, and uh, Radio that has to be the truck on, and uh, that all should be done by the end of this week. At Deckling next week, and then the following week, uh, Corey will have its truck. So, projects also coming to a close very quickly here. That is uh, great that we have some local people involved in in that, and maybe maybe the the able to get further business from us and further uh, works out too. So. All good. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to item 8.3. Oh, sorry. Brian? Well, I was just wondering on that note, uh, Stuart, whether you have an opportunity, uh, not that you need to sell stuff for TCB, but just to make other departments or other municipalities uh, with fire uh, coordinators like yourself aware that that technology is out there and that it can be done locally in southern Alberta. Um, it's such a good story, it'd be a shame that it doesn't get out. So I'm just curious if you have that opportunity, Stuart. Yeah, it's a very good uh, uh, point. Um, I have uh, had contact with uh, the Tabor, uh, the uh, Tabor County Fire Chief, uh, Brian Schaefer, because uh, they're in the market for, for a brush bug or rapid response vehicle. And they were kind of impressed, uh, one with the price point of, of the truck because all the other ones seem to be, uh, you know, upwards of 50 to $60,000 higher. So, so he was really impressed with uh, what was in it and, uh, and the equipment that I spec for it. So uh, I am passing that on. I'm trying to, you know, give our local businesses uh, as much uh, credit as they deserve. And it's really nice to see when you walk into uh, TCB, they've got a really nice um, uh, stand-up poster there that that uh, shows, I do believe it's Tilly's fire truck with the brush pack on the back and, and they're promoting it uh, in that way uh, when, when just the average customer comes walking in. Excellent. Hubie. Stu, I saw you at the lake on Friday, and you had some people there doing some exercises on the lake. I'm wondering how that was going. Perfect. Yeah, I can give you a quick update on that. Um, on uh, Saturday, uh, the county of, uh, well, the county of, no, the city of Brooks put on a multi-agency uh, water rescue exercise. So we had... Um, we had uh, Alberta Search and Rescue, or Southern Alberta Search and Rescue down out of Medicine Hat. We had uh, Red Cliff RCMP, um, uh, Corporal Shane, uh, uh, I've lost his last name. Uh, he's a search expert. Uh, he was down, we had RCMP local, we had uh, EMS local, we had Alberta Parks, uh, Fish and Wildlife. Um, nine different agencies came together um, and uh, we went out on the water and uh, we did an exercise where we had a boat that was taking on water that had six people. And uh, by the time the boats uh, got out to uh, the area where it was last seen, the boat actually was submerged in the water and we were looking for um, victims that were on the water or possibly swam to shore. As it turned out, all six victims uh, swam to shore. 
We had three different islands that uh, the six victims went to, two per each island. One was conscious, one was unconscious, which made it a little more difficult. Plus, we wanted to involve uh, CSAR as much as possible for doing ground searches and, and, and things like that. So um, uh, the exercise really, really well. Um, Sergeant uh, Bruce McDonald um, was the ICE command alongside with uh, Kevin and Barry. Um, I was uh, the water command. So I was the command boat that was in the middle of the water and directing traffic on where people should go and how we would do our searches and, and things like that. Uh, the exercise went from 10 o'clock till uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, we did find all our victims uh, by one o'clock, which was uh, very, very good. And then uh, right at the end of it, uh, Brooks Fire Department has purchased a, uh, it's called an aqua eye. And, and for lack of a better terms, it's like the side sonar that's on our boats, but it's made for you walk into the water or, or uh, and, and you can put the camera down into the water. It has a 15 degree deflection and it picks up on bodies that are in there. So on Friday, when I saw uh, uh, Councillor Callan there, uh, we were actually placing a dummy in the water so that it was sitting there for the next day. And we had people use the aqua eye to try and find the dummy that was in the water. And the aqua eye hit it on it, hit on it every time. And then we threw a bunch of, uh, um, of the firefighters, the Brooks firefighters, into the water in the water wetsuits. And the aqua I picked up on that at all as well. So it was actually a very, very successful uh, demonstration showing the people that when we have those close to shore type uh, accidents, that that uh, we can hopefully find the victim as quick as possible. And it's not just for shore; we can use it in the water and put it down into the water to hopefully find the same thing. It's just the deeper the water goes, you only have a 15 degree deflection. It's a little harder. You have to have the the victim pretty much pinned pointed to try and find them at the bottom of the lake in 50 feet of water. That's that's the report from the what happened on the weekend. Okay, thanks, Stu. That's great. Thanks for all your good work. Thank you. Okay, any other questions before I say goodbye to Stuart again? All good? Okay. Thank all you, right. Stuart. Have a great day. All right, I see Roberta down in the right-hand corner of my screen, ready to rock and roll. So we'll uh, go to item 83, Brooks Composite High School donation and intern request. Good morning, Council. I just want to start uh, by asking if anyone sees a fly in my hair to let me know. <laughs> I don't. I don't want that on video. <laughs> so. Um, as the RFD states, we have received a request from Brooks Composite High School asking for two things. They've asked for us to donate any networking or uh, server equipment or desktops that we may have available. And secondly, if we would provide opportunity for their students uh, to have a paid internship or part-time employment. You'd think this was a pretty easy question. But when I was giving your eight options, and I could have probably add more, I, I'm not sure if I overthought it, and hopefully you guys can simplify it for me. So the question really related to the first request of the IT equipment is, is really opportune, that request. We're replacing our servers as we speak, and networks due to be replaced next year. So there's quite a bit of equipment that is available for donation or for resale. So I tried to figure out what would the approximate value be of that equipment. We only had one hard and true quote that I can provide you, and that was for the servers, and it was $1,544, less $640 to actually put it through the resale process. Everything else, I, I Googled it. I looked it up on the Internet to kind of see where uh, a range is. The thing I found is that I think there is some value to the equipment yet, and I know our fiscal constraints that we're dealing with right now may dictate that we should actually do that. I do also know that the resale process will impact the profit that we would get from that sale. And the other thing is we actually had uh, 
sorry, my phone rang. It threw me right off. <laughs> I'll start again. <laughs> and I think it was my husband. I hope he watches this. <laughs> So uh, the other thing about the resale is when I was doing the Google search, there were hundreds of this type of equipment for sale, and if not hundreds, possibly even thousands. So it might be difficult for us to find a buyer, and even if we, you know, the longer it sits there, the less value it has. So I think that's one thing to consider. In the past, the IT equipment has been donated, but it's been donated to a third party. And we did it with a third party who then would repurpose it and give it to organizations who were in need. We used a third party so that we didn't have to, the county didn't have to make the decision or put the criteria together about who we donated it to. But when we do that, there's no guarantee that that equipment is staying in the area to benefit the area. So it would be past decision of council was to donate it to organizations who were in need. We would be in line with that, but this would just change it a little bit that we actually would determine who, who it would go to and it would benefit local. The paid intern request or part-time employment. The IT department at the County of Newell, I feel is adequately staffed to meet service levels as we currently are. I don't think we, there's a need for additional staff, I think we're very open to facilitating an internship program if that's the direction that council would want to go. Um, we're very open to that. And there's benefits to the local community that I'm sure council might want to consider to do with sustainability and to benefit the community. So we're open to it. I know that uh, when we look at costs, there's no cost to donating the equipment. There is a loss of revenue, potentially, in donating that equipment. There's no guarantee of what the resale value would be. I could have overestimated or I could have underestimated. So there's no guarantee of what that'll be. As to the second request, taking a look at the grids that we currently have for that type of an opportunity, for a three, three month, half day, we would estimate about a $6,000 cost to the county to provide the internship. So then we get to options, and I apologize, but I was thinking, well, you can approve both, you can re approve neither, you could approve one, you could approve the other. In the end, I've made a recommendation, and that is recommendation number eight, that we provide the opportunity for local organizations to request IT decommissioned equipment based on first come, first served, and IT availability, including Brooks Composite High School, and do not proceed with intern employment opportunities. Council. Thank you, Roberta. Questions? Anne-Marie. I have no question. You did a very uh, thorough job and it makes sense to me and option eight would be the one I would pick too. So I'm willing to make that motion and discussion if there's other comments. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Brian. Well, I would I would support that, except that I would I guess my question would be to Roberta, if you would, was there any mention of that internship where it would just be to provide uh, perhaps perhaps credit for a student that is willing to take that on rather than a paid position? Because if and and I guess with that what is the ramifications for training when it comes to either shadowing one of your staff or um, like th does that add a, a workload that would perhaps bog down some of the stuff that you're doing i guess i'm just trying to look at it through the lens of somebody that has worked with a student and it does take time um it's not that doesn't mean it shouldn't be done it's just a question of what kind of dedication what kind of resources would that take out of their normal day-to-day -day operations or the, the, the workload that you would normally have? Yeah, thank you for those questions, Brian. Um, so first off, I did have the discussion about it being a mutual beneficial experience, meaning we would gain some assistance and they would gain some experience and would that equal or satisfy? Uh, they were pretty clear that they felt the position should be paid. And I know there's always a lot of discussion about internship. 
whether it should be paid, do we take advantage of people if we don't pay them? Um, you know, it's certainly something if we wanted to pursue, I could offer that option again as an unpaid internship experience. And you're right, it will take, part of that discussion is it does take effort on the part of the county staff to be able to spend time with that person, to guide them, to mentor them, and to bring them through that, that experience. Um, and I think it would depend, the amount of time that would be required would be depend on the student that we get. Is it, he has advanced students and we, he has uh, students who are just learning. That's going to kind of determine, I think, the level of involvement we would have to have versus the level of benefit that we might receive from that individual. And, and that could come into play. All right, any other ideas, Kelly? Um, for me, um, I like that um, that you didn't indicate which organization would, would benefit from this. Um, my question was, how will you um, disseminate or um, uh, auction these items off throughout the county. Thank you for that question. So we would, uh, what, that, what my thoughts were is we would use our communication plan and our strategy that we already have at place at the County of Newell, where the website is our primary location of communication. We would post it there, but we would let the public know that that was there through social media our usual social media channels. And uh, that's what I would propose, getting that word out there. Any other questions? All right, we have uh, option eight as in a motion, seeing no further discussion, all in favor of that motion. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you, Roberta, for your for your work uh, on that. And um, <laughs> it's, it was very thorough. Of course, we we come to expect that. Thank you, Council. <laughs> All right. We will move on to item. 8-4, I see Matt is joining us, the Municipal Operating Support Transfer Grant Funding Program. Oh, maybe it's Lane that's doing that. Whoever is doing that, item 8-4. Good morning. Matt can certainly jump in as well if, if he's wanting to contribute during the discussion. The government has announced funds that are available for municipalities that will that are intended to offset additional costs that municipalities have incurred or losses in revenue that they have incurred as a result of COVID-19. The guidelines that were distributed with the information about the program very clearly outlines what is considered an eligible expense. As far as the county goes, it would be a stretch for us to come up with additional expenses that would offset the entire amount that's available. And what we're suggesting is that because we do not operate directly recreation facilities, and there are many groups in the county that will have it in some significant revenue losses, the consideration should be given to make some of these funds available to them for costs that they would have incurred as well. So that's really the question or the discussion before council this morning is whether or not we should be looking at making a portion of these funds, probably a very significant portion of these funds available to the groups that are operating recreation facilities throughout the county. Clarence. 
Well, I do believe that there's been considerable income loss by our groups because they cannot rent out their halls and that type of thing. So it may well be worthwhile. But I also question the fact, do we really know how much it's going to cost us until we actually collect taxes at the end of the year? Well, good question. I guess it would be difficult for us to really state clearly that a reduced tax collection is a direct result of COVID-19. And I think that the intention of this is that it's offset costs that we have incurred to manage the response to COVID-19 or losses in revenue and whether a higher uncollectible rate can be attributed to, to, uh, to COVID is probably a question that may be a bit of a challenge to clearly um, state a claim on. Clarence? Well, I guess my little rant from last week, last meeting uh, comes into play here beautifully again. Because you always have to make things up when you apply for some of these things. And I, I don't think it's any stretch to, the, to say, we know that halls aren't being rented out or facilities aren't being rented out because of COVID. There are groups and, and industries in our, our midst that are, are being affected because they've had to lay off people. There's costs involved and, and they have been affected by COVID. That, that's, that's really no different. So it's not to use our imagination a little bit when there's money available, we, it's not, not the right move either. Lane, are these um, funds used for library facilities within our It would, it could be used for any municipal um, service that is being provided. And I would think the problem library facilities could as well. Um, Section 5.2 in the program guidelines outlines what is considered an eligible expense. Operating losses or deficits could include losses or deficits due to DQ decreases in revenues, such as parking fees, recreation facility entrance fees, and building permit fees. And I would expect that fees that libraries collect would certainly be part of that. I just question whether or not we would be able to put forward a, a legitimate argument that the decrease in our tax collection is directly attributed to COVID-19. Uh, the argument can certainly be made but whether or not municipal affairs is going to accept that as an eligible expense is a good question. And Lane, we have some time to, so we, we have until the end of March, the information? Correct. The program is offset expenses or revenue losses from April 1st, 2020 until the end of March 2021. So there is some time for us. But if we're going to be making these funds available to community groups, it's going to take us some time to put together some criteria for the distribution of those funds and determine how they would be eligible. Right. We should be working hard to include everyone we can possibly include. Uh, guidelines. Or Kelly, sorry. I just wanted to share that libraries have had to make modifications for service delivery to open, reopen. And 
our local egg society on the west side here has received applications at some of those expenses at our library um, and uh, so I've um, I've also suggested that they check with uh, the town of Bazano to see if um, to see if they have the most funding available as well so um, it, is, it is an expense that libraries have had to incur to reopen Tracy? Tracy, we can't hear you. Is that better? I'm having trouble with technology today. Um, yeah, I think like there's so many facets of groups to look at. Um, you know, if we look at just even our community halls in the area, um, you know, they haven't been able to open and most of them, you know, they're, they're still paying expenses. Like there's still expenses that utilities and stuff that run through that building regardless of whether it's operational or not. So I think that this is a really good program and, um, you know, if we can provide a little bit of extra funding to these groups, um, I think we should look at, you know, as many as possible. Of course, we're not going to have enough money to provide everybody with some, but um, it's definitely something for sure worth looking at. So Lane, we can, oh, Brian, go ahead. Sorry. Well, and I, I think that the, when, and maybe it's getting too far ahead of it, but I think what you have, we have to come up with is, is an actual proof of revenue loss by the groups that are going to apply for it. Because you could take a, a haul, for example, and I'm just going to pick on Bow City for a bit. So if you have maybe a half a dozen functions a year on a normal year and you've gone to zero, or whether you've had a haul like the Castles Hall or the Duchess Hall that perhaps has 50 um, functions a year and they go to zero, there's quite a bit of difference in that actual revenue loss as far as what they would would garner. So I hope that's kept into consideration. And the same for libraries. I mean, they, we have to be able to have a proof of the actual uh, ramifications of the losses that, that have been incurred due to this specific uh, pandemic. Um, there's other examples where there's going to be increases in revenue. Uh, um, and I don't know the numbers, but I know like the Duchess Golf Course has never been busier. Brooks Golf Course has never been busier than this year. And um, I don't know if that's all translated into profit or whether there are members that are doing more. Uh, no idea. But I think, you know, in order to qualify for anything that we are um, looking at, we have to be, the, the, the group has to be able to prove that they've had hardship in the form of financial hardship. And I guess the other question is 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 and uh, uh, is okay. So if it's a municipality-owned facility, like most of the Brooks ones are, how does that factor into it? Um, <clears throat> is the municipality um, like one like like in Duchess in my community? Um, how is that going to work with their grant funding? I'm assuming that they're going to have the same um, opportunity to apply for this, but how are they going to view the egg societies within our community. So those are all questions that I don't have answers to, and maybe you don't either, Lane, but I'm just, you know, it's, it's sort of what percolates in my mind when it comes to how do we deal with this fairly as far as uh, being able to supply or, or uh, aid these communities so they can keep going or these community groups. Kelly? So, so Brian, I was thinking differently. I was thinking that every municipality is getting this most funding offered to them, and what they decide to do with it is up to those municipalities. So I saw this funding as going directly to county properties or uh, it, um, owned owned properties and ran within the county of Newell. So that's 
thing that you included the, the other municipalities that have the same funding coming to them. Yeah, through, the, through the chair, uh, Madam Reeve, I, I guess I'm looking at it at a, at a model that would be <clears throat> helpful to those community groups. It's the, the focus that I would like to do is the community groups, whether it's an egg society or uh, just a standalone castles hall or silver sage. I mean, all those, all those places have been affected. I'm just not sure to what extent. And if you could come to either either municipality, whether it's in our case in the village of Duchess or the county of Newell, I think they need to be aware of how the funds are going to be spread around so that it helps those groups because they're the ones that are that are going to struggle to stay open and to pay the bills. And uh, <clears throat> I just think it needs to be done on a on a means basis and show how much you've actually lost as far as revenue. So, Lane, what you're asking for today is the concept of that we're going to need to come up with a, a, a ideas of of how how this could work. Correct. The, the main thing that I need council direction on right now is whether or not funding under this program can be passed on to other community groups. If, if that's the direction that council is prepared to provide. I certainly hope that that's the case. And what we would do is go back and try and put together some criteria for how those funds would be flowed through the county to those respective groups that have experience and impact on their operations. We would come back to council with some guidelines that we would propose that that program would be based on. So I'm hearing that people are interested in that. Um, is there anyone who does not feel that we need to be turning to our community to see how we can use this money? I think everything I've heard leads me to believe, Lane, that we need to proceed in that direction. Different ideas from council regarding that? More information returned um, road here. QB. So, Lane, you've got that meeting coming up uh, in Castles October 22nd. There should be a lot of feedback coming from the communities at that meeting. Correct. There is a meeting that we have scheduled for October 22nd to each and tonight. Uh, we can certainly put this out there as one of those things that would be up for discussion. It would be appropriate to include this information because those are the groups that we would be wanting to reach out to on this. Yeah. Enough direction, Lane? I think so. We'll get started on it. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, item 8.5. Oh, no, wait. Cole is here. Is it must be, yes, 10.47. Okay. Hi, Cole. Welcome. And... Uh, you can just go ahead with your report. Thank you very much, Reeve Douglas and councillors. Um, I will start off with the bigger one, um, the leak that we've been trying to locate and get to in Tilly um, at the new pump post there. We found it. It was uh, a joint on the plumbing coming into the old reservoir, uh, the fill line. So we've located it. Um, it's contained we're kind of pumping out the hole it's 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 been leaking for quite a while just with all the saturation in the area but it's located we've got parts ordered it should be a simple plumbing fix um it won't be hard to do so next week it should be all back to the way it should be and repaired and in, in service so, and i'd like to mention that we they've had no operational issues as far as supplying water to tilly in the interim so Everything's been fine. No regulatory worries or anything like that. Water's potable, so just thought I'd mention that as well. It's worth noting. Um, so that's really good news. We'll move on to uh, our fall maintenance 
we usually flush the hydrants and L and R in Tilly, so we'll be able to do that after the repair is done in Tilly. Uh, Jeff has asked us not to do it in L and R this year due to the hydro seeding he's done in the ditches out there, so we don't want to wash away all his new seed. So um, it's not that big of a deal if we put it off because you only usually have to do it once or twice a year, and so we'll get it in the spring. Um, so it, it, it should be all right to do that. Um, we will be going ahead with a a sample hydrant project at Lake Newell Resort. Um, I just to refresh your memories, we've had on the books for budget to put in dedicated sampling stations in Lake Newell Resort because there are no businesses that we can go into, and people are really reluctant to let us go into their homes. So Alberta Environment wants us to go around and take a uh, water samples throughout the distribution system. So in Lake Newell Resort, that's always been hard. We've only been doing it at the pump house. So we've bought five sampling hydrants that we'll be installing throughout in different locations throughout Lake Newell Resort. So we've purchased the hydrants and we've just gone through uh, the tendering process for the contractor to do that. So Brooks Asphalt's going to be installing those. We hope to do that before the end of this construction season. <coughs> Over to the rural water project. Um, if you can see in my report, I said that there's one new hookup and one issue with the float assembly in the last month. Well, since I've written this report in the last few days, we've had a couple on each side, so it's now three and three. So that's where that. But as far as everything else, everything's going really well with the county rural water project. Normal operations are observed. Um, just to Go over it again, we had a, a transformer issue, so we've installed that in Scandia. It was, uh, so they were having a little bit of power fluctuations or is issues for the lift station in Scandia. So Inphase came out and replaced that transformer, so it's all good to go again. Um, we will be discharging the remaining sewage lagoons uh, next week. So that includes uh, Patricia, if needed. We're, we're kind of looking at it and we probably won't have to again. Um, they've had enough evaporation and there's not a whole lot in there. So, but we're go go going through the kind of surveying process and uh, we don't think we'll have to do Patricia, but uh, Tilly definitely we will. And Scandia, there's a little bit more that we can apply to the, the adjacent lands because that's how we, we discharge that with them. Um, at the beginning of this week, we uh, we cleaned out all four Hamlet lift stations. We we got big S to come out and spray them out and vacuum them out. So they're all clean and ready to go for the winter months. So we shouldn't have any operational issues that we'll have to worry about in the four lift stations throughout the winter. And that's, again, part of our fall maintenance program that we always do. And that is the extent of my report. If there's any questions. Anne Marie Cole, when discharging a lagoon, is there um, a connection with when the water from the EID is turned off? I just always assumed that there was some flushing needed with irrigation water. Sometimes the the EID will hold some water back and then let it go after we're done discharging, but it's not necessary. Um, so especially Patricia, we don't have to worry about it because we're probably not going to let it go. Um, but uh, Tilly, for sure, we will. Uh, but we always have to wait until after the EID shuts down before we do. So and we have to give downstream landowners uh, written notice a week prior before we discharge. So that's already been done. So we'll, we'll be good to go next week. But whether the EID decides to flush or not, it it doesn't really much matter because in the spring they'll fill everything up and it'll be flushed out anyway, so before users are allowed to get, get back on it. Lionel? Hi, Cole. Um, those float valves are still, we're having some troubles with them yet. There have been some plastic valves that, that have been tried. Uh, do you have any feedback on the success of those or not, or have they not been in, around long enough yet i've heard nothing but good things about them but the feedback has been pretty limited we usually don't tend to hear anything once people have rectified the issue that they have we're just kind of 
I'm having an issue. Can you come turn the water off so that I can deal with this? And then we don't hear much back after that. But you're right. Those plastic valves are available and I've heard good things about them, but I don't know any long-term stories really, you know, enough to say one way or the other, they're the way to go or not. Kind of thing. Cause there's still quite a problem with valves. I've replaced three of them now. Place one again, so I and I don't know why it's picking on me, but but for some reason I'm having trouble with. It. Right. I was considering so, going to a plastic one. No, I think that yeah, you couldn't hurt it because obviously you're not getting the longevity out of the the brass one, so that would be a good o second option. Brian, Cole, when you discharge Scandia, where does that go into? What system does that go into? Just into the irrigation canal and then downstream into vent or okay. So I know no. you, we irrigate out there, but I was just wondering. Yes, that's where that one goes. So rolling hills in Scandia are the two that are applied to the adjacent lands via the pivot. So it doesn't actually go into a canal or where the other ones were Tilly and Patricia, City of Brooks, Duchess, they all do go into some form or another of a canal to get, and it go, eventually gets to the Red Deer. Anything else for Cole? Seeing no other hands for questions. Thank you, Cole. You're welcome. Have a good uh, rest of your day. As well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move ba back in our agenda item 8.5, 2021 Southern Alberta Ortho Photo Partnerships. Thanks, Madam Kevin. Reeve. Morning, everybody. So we've been uh, contacted by the CAO from Willow Creek. Uh, they had sent an email out earlier, and I guess he had the wrong server information. So we just got... Uh, a reset one a couple of weeks ago or about 10 days ago and uh, we had uh, known that uh, the partnership was was looking at flying uh, southern alberta again next year they've done seven of them i think every three years uh, we've been in it uh, most years some years we've only done the, the hamlets and uh, the developed areas at a higher scale and we've just beefed up the data that we have on the system uh, we partnered with the irrigation district uh, the last few, and of course they are very interested in having it done again. Uh, they can't confirm for sure because they're like us, or they haven't uh, finished their budget process, so um, they think it's you know it's going to fly. So this, we know the the rough cost will be around ninety thousand. That's what it's been, but that depends on how many um, companies bid on it and how attractive it is so we'll always have the option to step out of this uh, if we don't have the interest but um, we do need to appoint um, willow creek because they've offered and they have done it in the past to to be the managing partner and they do the rfp and do all of that information uh, they're planning to use uh, kamal from the city of calgary which we've used for i don't know how many years at least for as long as i've been here and uh, He's the consultant that does the geospatial work for the uh, city of Calgary. Very smart, uh, gets good information, gets it pulled together. So um, as I said, we have the option to pull out in the end if, if the prices are too high, but we have to get back to Willow Creek. They give us till uh, Monday uh, on it. So I said we would put on this agenda and find out from council if, if they'd be prepared to um, partake again at least at this point and, and appoint them as the managing partner. Brian? So I, I guess my question is, is, is this technology relevant? Um, mostly because of Google Earth and satellite imagery and you know they can come down and take pictures of a coin on your deck basically and read the date on it. Uh, so I just am curious about that part of it. I, I, I'm fully supportive of us doing, um, getting the information. I'm just wondering if there's a, if there's different means out there that's being used in other municipalities to collect this information rather than 
using the um, flying technology. Yeah, so there, I think there will be some options uh, for use in the future. Uh, Google information, if you look at uh, Google overlays versus our aerial that we did three years ago, you'll see it's not, it's not even up to date with that at times. So um, the group feels that we need to do at least one more. Um, the ID, of course, they want, uh, they're interested in, in information that's, that's current. So, um, and they like it done at a certain time of the year. So when it's, things are green. Um, so from what I'm hearing is that we don't have the technology right now that municipalities can do that's any cheaper than this. Uh, especially when we do it as a group. Brian? Well, then I'll make that motion to, uh, to uh, um, move forward as recommended by um, our administration. Just a question, Kevin, the, the, um, the $90,000 is like, do the, the, does EID put in 90,000 as well or, or are we? Well, if we remember the last time we did this and we're going to do the same thing again, um, they ask all the IDs to, to chip in and, and pay for it. But we've said that we represent the same people, basically the same area. And so we're not interested in each putting in 90. So what we've done in the past is we've split it. They've allowed mm -hmm. us to do that. Um, of course, if it's 180,000, I, I would have a different opinion on it. But. Yeah. All right, so the motion basically is to approve the participation and we still have the option. Um, I guess we still are unsure of we haven't heard anything more about our assessment model for 2021 and um, no indication, Kevin, of when we're going to hear that either, right? Just early in the end of October is all I've heard. Yeah, I, I haven't heard anything. I, I've, the only thing that they've told me is that we're going to know for budget next year of what the implications are going to be. but. What that means going forward, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I was going to update council a bit on that at the when, when that comes up there on the agenda, the public awareness. All right. eight, nine, but. Okay. All right. So uh, the motion is to approve the participation and appoint uh, Willow Creek as a managing partner. Further discussion? It's moved by Brian. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Um, we will move to, uh, well, item eight, nine, I just asked Ariana to keep on the, uh, the agenda, but uh, we're waiting to hear more from the government uh, and we haven't um, done any more public awareness. So we'll move on to um, item 810, checks for payment. Payment register. And Holly, um, after that um, information was put in the newspaper, were there any um, phone calls, any emails that came in as a reaction to that information? Anybody have any questions or conversations or I think I mentioned um, at our last meeting that I had run into two different people that was in Brooks that um, were quite on our side just sort of the comment was wow you've had a lot on your plate this summer I wasn't quite sure what they were referring to and it, it was about this this disagreement with the government of Alberta. So that's the only comments I've I've had. Brian, I I had a similar experience, Molly, and and I think that uh, in the I probably had six people that made comments on it. I could be about one or two, but they're they're they were very appreciative of the information that was put out and how it was done in a in a very concise and and easy to understand um, format. So. 
um, appreciative, but also questioning about um, where, like, what it means for the future, like when those timetables are going to be uh, more ironed out. And of course, you know, um, as we all know, until we know more details, it's difficult to uh, uh, to give a response to that particular question, right? Kevin? I as well, Madam Reeve, have, have heard from a few people that they appreciate that. Um, it puts a different perspective in their mind. I've also heard from a number of other ones that are, are still um, lingering on the 466% increase and you know that does hasn't left their minds so i've been uh i got contacted by the western producer somebody turned them on me and uh, so i talked to a guy yesterday and did an interview um for him and uh, i said really i can't be the spokesman for council but i can give him some some information about things that uh you know he's going to put an article in the paper because he said, there's no farms that can afford 466%, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, absolutely. I said, our intent was never to increase taxes uh, with this. I said, we've always considered or are considering looking at reducing services and reducing capital and whatever we need to do. But um, I said, at the end of the day, we need to find out from the province exactly what the impact of this is. I said, if it's a temporary two, three years, I said, we can live with that. But if it's the model that they produced, that uh, basically oil and gas won't pay any taxes after year 16. I said it's not sustainable for us or any municipality to have to build services around those those assets that are still used that don't pay any tax anymore. So he asked me some questions about uh, what our position was on renewable energy. And I said, well, we support development at the County of Newell here. Obviously, our preference would be something that's 24-7 and not something that is uh, temporary because the investment then we know is, can be relied on at any, any given time. I said that um, RMA was the big, you know, the big uh, push behind getting the information out to people so they, they could understand the impacts of this. And, and so I've, I've done a lot of time trying to educate people, I guess, with regards to it and they all appreciate it. Um, but, I think it all it always lingers back in their mind that the only option to, out of this is tax increases. So the more that we can talk about that um, portion, I think the better. Thanks, Kevin. Glad they tracked you down. <laughs> Information is always <clears throat> always important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I, I continue to think and hope that uh, we can, you know, be part of the solution if, if our uh, assessment is going to change in a huge way. So we need to have some conversations about that. Um, it, it would appear to me that these days the federal government is more interested in uh, pretending the oil and gas industry is a dead one. Um, so that that is concerning because I think uh, green green is great, but as Kevin said, it isn't twenty four seven, and uh, I think we're always gonna or we're gonna need uh, oil and gas for a lot longer than perhaps people believe. Anything else on that? And I, I know RMA did ask us too if, if there's suggestions going forward for the tax assessment or solutions for this. So we need to be uh, helping, as we have been always, to put forth ideas that make it uh, urging the government to do specific things. So. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they come up with in the next few weeks. Hopefully faster than that even. All right, we'll go on to checks for payment. Payment register. Any questions on the payment 
register. If not, a motion to accept it. Lionel moves that. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Request for functions of council. Seeing none, I will move on to our municipal services report. I see Mark is available. Item 9-2. Good morning, Council. Uh, for the past month here, uh, keeping up with municipal enforcement, the traffic safety calendar, uh, it looks like every uh, motorist behaved fairly well with the back to school being the priority as uh, there were zero warnings issued, um, but two tickets. Um, so low, low statistics on that regard, which is good to see from the public. Zero tickets would have been better. Uh, officers issued 19 warnings and nine tickets as a result of 33 investigations over the past month. And uh, the municipal enforcement team fulfilled partner hourly commitments. Fleet Services continues to wor work with uh, receiving um, capital acquisitions between fleet trucks and stuff. Uh, much of that was actually delayed due to shutdowns at manufacturers' plants and stuff this year. So uh, our final uh, fleet truck arrived just uh, two weeks ago, I believe that was. So working on getting those into the shop, put into service, and then taking the old fleet out of service. Operations Department, greater operators, uh, you know, they're kind of making their final rounds for what appears to be the uh, spring, summer, fall season. Um, last year at this time we had the white stuff on the ground, uh, so we're very fortunate to have the weather that we have right now, but uh, they are working with dry conditions, uh, washboards present and whatnot, so they're trying to get that cleaned up before freeze up comes, which is likely to be November. Um, and on top of that, of course, getting uh, the winter attachments, the side wings and, and things ready so that uh, when the white stuff does show up, we're capable of responding to that as needed. Truck drivers completed the annual road uh, resurfacing program, so graveling, and uh, they also cleaned up and got um, a lot of the gravel surfacing of shoulder poles and stuff completed. And they too are getting their plow trucks ready for winter services, obviously because pavement needs to be done a little bit sooner than what our gravel roads do. And uh, with that, maintenance operators continue doing what they're doing, keeping signs maintained, replaced, uh, anything that's damaged, broken, or whatever. Uh, also doing the deline delineator reinstallations along the roadways and anything else that needs to be cleaned up before winter. And then uh, the other odds and ends that they tend to with cleaning up uh, disposal of materials in roadside ditches and, and things like that. Uh, there was a, an effort in the Bazano yard uh, to clean up some very old material stockpiles that were in there, and, uh, and that was completed over the last month as well. Shoulder pulls and rolling hills are complete, and um, the 2019 shoulder pulls with culvert replacements uh, are also complete. Hamlet of Tilly Back Alley improvements uh, were in progress. Um, they should be wrapped up. I haven't touched base with Terry on that one since returning from my leave of absence last week, but uh, it seemed like everything was going relatively well in that back alley. And hopefully with those improvements, we won't have any um, rain and snow melt waters getting into anybody's property causing problems. Um, Eastern Irrigation District continued working on two projects in Rolling Hills that we partnered with them for ditch improvements uh, outside of the, the partnership work. And um, after that, um, I just talked about the fleet truck again because it was operations that received that. And we're just really getting prepared for onset of winter. So snow fencing and things will be some of those activities that take place in those key locations to reduce drifting across uh, county roads and stuff over uh, the month of October here, and, and we'll just keep plugging away with that. Under engineering water and wastewater, uh, we have the Highway 876 partnership on paving, which is complete. The construction completion certificate has been issued on that. So cleanup and uh, minor works are ongoing, and then final acceptance will be scheduled uh, 12 months uh, into, into 2021 there. And uh, hopefully everything's in good standing order and, and we're done. So. Really, that concludes the, the
the partnership with Alberta Transportation on uh, approximately 42 kilometers of highway in our, our area, right? No, 32 kilometers in our area. Um, I think it's really get great accomplishment and, and staff efforts from, from Jeff and stuff were, were excellent on that and making it a success. If you've been driving into Brooks lately, you'll see that the work on uh, 15th Avenue and 2nd Street West is underway with the traffic light installations. Uh, there's definitely been some um, comments and criticisms of more traffic lights and stuff going in and why do we need these things and so on and so forth. Just really want to remind council that that was a condition of Alberta transportation for the development of that parcel in the northwest corner of the intersection. And uh, we're just making do so that we continue to proceed with allowing development to take place within our region. So uh, hopefully their plan is to kick off and, and get that parcel developed once we get all these things done and, and we can see that happen. So um, the concrete bases for the uh, traffic control lights are going in right now. I believe they've got two out of the four done and they're working on the third today, I think. And that's about where that sits. The uh, Bazano aggregate uh, pit crush is in progress and um, ballast isn't scheduled to commence until next year. The North Headgates contractor being Brooks Asphalt and Aggregate, they're on site taking care of minor works uh, and most of the uh, third party utilities, Dinosaur Gas, Fortis Alberta and stuff, they've been in uh, dealing with their infrastructures as need be to facilitate the redevelopment. MP Engineering continues working on the Rural Water Project Phase 2 that uh, Council had asked us to look into. We had a high level look at the numbers there last meeting when we were talking about the Municipal Stimulus uh, Program funding that was made available by the province, um, but uh, still waiting final on, on that stuff. And uh, we do have the Patricia Sewer Video CCTV inspection. Um, that's going to be under review and being looked at for the uh, 2021 budget as to what we may need to propose to council uh, for, for improvements and such there. Other than that, uh, we did a lot of work getting things ready for the county's core audit, the Certificate of Recognition for Safety, and um, getting a lot of that documentation uh, moved over to electronic means from paper. Uh, we got the budget submitted on time with narrative and accomplishments and future year's objectives. And um, we're looking forward to that budget presentation with council and seeing what, uh, what we're going to have to do here with the challenging times. And um, yeah, we've just been working on uh, attending a few things that have been put out there by the American Public Works Association for um, staying at home learning and, and professional development opportunities because they have rolled out a number of uh, opportunities here uh, since August. So taking up some of that, getting some of our staff involved that never have had the opportunities to participate because they've been things that you've had to go and attend. And uh, it's actually quite refreshing to see uh, some of these made through video conferencing technology where we can expand that scope at a nominal fee to, uh, to staff to receive that development. So that's where we're at and I'd gladly answer any questions of council. Thank you, Mark. Any questions? Hubie? Just a compliment, Mark, to you and the staff for your quick response to our Tilly uh, wish list and our advisory board. And we look forward to the projects getting done here in Tilly. And just want to say thank you for that. Not a problem. Just uh, if they, if if any of those hamlets have things that they wish to identify that uh, we can accommodate, we'll definitely do it. Where it takes a little bit more that needs to be budgeted, we'll look at it in a future year. But no, we're getting things done. Thank you. Well, don't see any other questions, Mark. So thank you very much. And we'll have a motion to accept the municipal report. Uh, moved by Tracy. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Next on the agenda is the item to, uh, it's a request for proclamation for Small Business Week. And 
if a small business week proclamation would help small businesses <laughs> in any way shape or form it's certainly uh, something i'd be in favor of who would like to make that motion ellen okay ellen moves the proclamation all in favor opposed motion is carried oh yes item 10 2 is a request for uh, Paul McLaughlin I think I just forwarded the the email to you and I just thought well if he wanted to set up a time he, he sort of misunderstood me I think because he was going he was ready for today um, and I said I would just let you people decide if you wanted to um, do it at all basically so Wayne. Yeah, I'd like to hear from him, see what uh, he has in mind and what kind of person he is. So I, I just uh, thought that, I mean, he can uh, pick a time, I guess, and set up a Zoom meeting with us. Is, is that what, what um, you guys would think is appropriate? And whoever can make it, and I, I don't know why he wouldn't do that with more than one municipality at a time. I, I'm, I'm not sure if, yeah, if he's doing this with all municipalities or, or what the, the story is. Tracy. Can we have him set up for a time on our next council meeting instead of taking like another, like, a, like are you saying a separate meeting just for him or would he come to like be part of our next agenda? Whatever whatever your wishes would be. Anne-Marie? Is he the only one running for president? Uh, are there other candidates for vice president? Can we put them all together, give them half an hour? Or my first thought actually was write something on paper and send it to us. Um, I asked him the question if there were any others had announced or others that he knew of and he said no, um, not at this point and that he didn't even know of any um, interest or names coming from the, the zones. So that's, that's all I know. Brian? Well, myself, I would rather um, take him to a Zoom meeting and, and it not be part of the uh, council agenda. Um, I think that that he's what he has to offer or present or questions that we have. Um, we're trying to encourage our public to be part of that, and I think this is somewhat distance from our regular people that would be happening to be tuned into our life size meeting. Um, so I, I just, you know, and I presume, prefer either a Zoom meeting or whether, whether the protocol, just so I can um, understand a little bit more about him. I do know him a little bit, but uh, I think that's the avenue that I would prefer. Any other thoughts? Clarence? I agree with what Brian was saying, the same thoughts that crossed my mind. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, he, he is the one that wants to uh, communicate with us. So I think I just wanted uh, to ask your opinions and I thought I would get back to him and say, yeah, set up a time and whoever can make it. Um, no different than anyone else sort of campaigning for something. I'm, like I said, I, I have no idea. If he's doing this with all municipalities, I would be surprised because it would take a lot of time. I don't know why he wouldn't do some combination ones. So I think I'll suggest that if he wants to have us with other municipalities as well, it's not a problem. Uh, it's up to him. It's his. It's his deal. So and it, and he did. I think in that email he did request that we think about things 
give our opinions about the direction of RMA and stuff that we thought, you know, pluses and minuses, I guess, positives and negatives. So, Brian? Yeah, and just on that note, I've, I've been participating in the FCM um, election process um, because it was our year to go to FCM. So um, I didn't hear too many of the speeches, but I did I did involve myself in some of the online Q&A for the candidates, um, uh, Scott Pierce being one of them. And, um, and I was actually surprised at how few people were in. Like it was like six. Throughout, and this is throughout the country for vice president. So I was I was quite shocked that there was that few people that were involved. And so he spoke to me directly. He was like, welcome, Brian. Uh, nice to see you're on. And I know Al from Alberta, even though I'm from Ontario. And this was before Al at our own meeting. So um, anyways, it's just, I think it's a great opportunity that if you do want to ask him a question directly, and and also, I think I, I actually appreciate the fact that he's reaching out to us as a county specifically because um, we can express our concerns about what he probably already knows. But I think that it doesn't hurt to highlight some of our the issues that are going on within our community and perhaps bringing them to his attention or seeing his perspective on them. So I, I like the fact that he's reaching out to counties individually. I, I haven't gone online for any of the forums or whatever for FCM, but I did get my vote cast for Scott. <laughs> and he won. So that's good. Um, Ellen? Wrong button. I was just going to say sooner, um, I think it's good for relationships, especially when he becomes the president of RMA. Uh, he's interested in meeting with us personally so I think it's a win-win situation if one else is running so far and I mean I know him a bit and he's a very approachable man and um, and I think it's, it's nothing but a good situation for relationships in going for uh, in the future so I will respond and I'll put you in the I'll just respond from us all that we had a discussion at council and that um, we appreciate his interest and if he wants to set up a time that works for him um, outside a council meeting that uh, as many of us will attend as can. Sound reasonable? Yes? Okay. Sounds good. Um, Information items. It's not really an information item, but it's a question. Um, the the Brooks ICF folks just basically we're just sort of waiting on uh, more information on our assessment model. Is that is that still where that one's at, Clarence? Well, since there's a lot of dollars involved there, I, I don't think we're in a position to say yes or no to that at this point in time. Um, and I think uh, let's put it on the shelf. And it's basically completed, but... So no. my perspective is accurate then? Yeah. And of course, for budget prep, we... The, the, everything goes together. The, the, the provincial announcements, whatever they come up with, will will sort of tie into that as well, obviously. All right. Um, I think that's it for our meeting, except for um, correct, Brian. Unless I was asleep, I don't think we dealt with uh, a meeting with ministers, 8.6. Oh. 8. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I was asleep, obviously. Meetings with ministers, thank you. Item 8.6, 8. we'll go backwards on um, the agenda.
any any updates or anything different? Um, Kevin had mentioned did he get some information from the Water Act folks, and Clarence has his hand up. So, Clarence, I see that. Like we talked about farm assessment last meeting as being part something we wanted to discuss and real hesitancy to to push that issue. I know we think that they're under assessed, but we have gone in the practice of trying to get some more dollars from our farm assessment as it is by raising the mill rates. Uh, even if we got true assessment on farm la <coughs> farmlands, I don't think we would increase our our money by much. By by that, all of a sudden there's a huge assessment increase. I think we'd still be doing a slow progression of trying to get more money from our farmland. In an organized matter rather than into a amount right away just because the assessment went up. I don't really know if we want to push that issue. I, I agree with the fact that maybe it should be that way, but to do it because we think we should be getting more money from farmland, we already have that ability today by ch changing our mill rates. So just wondering what, what we could gain politically by pushing that issue. Wayne. Well, I've got, uh, first of all, I don't give a damn what uh, politically we can make with, because I, well, I'm not running next time. So and secondly, uh, you're right, Clarence, we can control how much taxes we charge farmers, but why should we be doing this based on 30-year-old 30, 30 information or assessments? This is not, uh, just give us the, the true assessment of what the farmland is worth today, and then we can work from there. By working, not changing the assessment, which I think the last information I got was a 92 or something, Come on, let's get it to the modern times and uh, let every council, rural council, decide how they want to proceed from that. But by keeping the assessment so low or out of date, how does that help us or anyone else? Clarence? Is yes, that it doesn't really help or hinder us, so. Like, why create a storm? Seeing no further hand <clears throat> response, um, I, I myself sort of uh, tend to, <laughs> with everything that's gone on with the uh, other, the linear assessment, I really don't want to talk a lot more about assessment. Um, part of the reason at Foothills Little Bow, and I've argued it from the other side at times, not, not at Foothills Little Bow, was uh, when the province, there was the, the, the resolution from Willow Creek to urge the province to get involved with negotiating and taking away the, the leases, the, the public leases. Um, you know, my first reaction was why why would you want to upset people at this point in time in, in rural Alberta with everything that's that's going on with the, the oil and gas assessment and the possibilities that exist? Um, so I, I sort of feel the same with the farmland one. It's it's up to them. And I, I think we are making small strides. And you know what? If we didn't have an agricultural industry right now within the county of Newell, uh, I don't know what it would be like here. It's, it's, I think it's really showed its um, historical importance and how it's always there. 
sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, but it's been awesome to have it strong right now under the circumstances. Brian and Lionel. Well, and you, you bring up a, <clears throat> a good point, uh, Douglas, and you and I both were um, uh, participating in the AUMA convention and the question and answer period that the ministers were taking. And one of the comments that we were sort of scratching our heads about was, and it wasn't in regards to farmland assessment, but it was in regards to linear assessment that the the suggestion was made that when assessment is straightened out that it should be shared by all Albertans and the revenue from that assessment. You want to go down that road, I guess, with farmland too? Because that's the potential you're opening up, that if they see there's uh, billions and billions, trillions of dollars that in assessment that isn't perhaps valued at where it's supposed to be, realist as a market value thing, are we opening ourselves up that that assessment needs to be shared by, that urban municipalities are going to say, hey, some of that assessment belongs to us? I don't believe it, but that potential is there. And uh, I don't think that's a, that's a road that I ever want to go down. Um, you know, Wayne, you make good points. I mean, market value assessment is the way that most everything else operates. But again, when we when you look at it from the from the big picture about what we can assess these these properties and these values, we do have control of that. And uh, I think this has taught us a lesson a little bit about reviewing the assessment model um, with what we're dealing with through the assessment model review. Is that sometimes um, be careful what you ask for. It might uh, it might come back to haunt you. Wayne? You know, uh, on the other point of view, we, we don't just represent farmers here. We represent small businesses that work in the rural areas, and they get assessed every year or every five years. And they have just, you know, they've got just as much interest in their business as farmers do. And we look at them, we raise uh, the mill rate on industrial and all that at appropriate times. But, oh, wait a minute, we can't touch farmers. Uh, they're businessmen just like everybody else. And they are not everywhere. We, every community is different. But they use our infrastructure a lot more every year than they have been, say, 30 years ago. But we still don't we don't adjust the assessment on that. And another thing is, uh, we're all sitting here thinking, oh, the poor farmers. A lot of these are corporations nowadays. They're not even they're uh, big business, and we we we're crying because the oil companies are they want to get their assessment down, but they're hurting like crazy. But we we're, we want to keep that assessment where it is. But we don't want to be just and look at the farmland, which is the same thing. They're businesses, and we should be looking at them also. Lionel? Well, Madam Reeve, I like your comment about small adjustments. It's always a problem when you make adjustments with shock value. You get into political questions. And I, I think this will, you know, there will be adjustments over time. And if you can, if you can bring them in slowly, then it, it's, it's something you can absorb in a, as a business or as a farmer, whatever you are. And so I do like your comment there. Other thoughts? So this is in regards to a meeting with with Minister Allard, and I guess I'm I'm fine with having a um, temp to be determined type of meeting relevant to what we find out in the next. Uh, I, I'm hoping soon. Um, I'll defer back also to Brian. But when we listened to her speak um, two weeks ago, I guess that was now at the AUMA bear pit session 
I was thinking that we were going to get an announcement early in October and that it would be a for this year only type of thing while they take a bigger and um, longer look at the linear taxation issues. And so I'm, I'm optimistic that 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 change that she inter tells us, I mean, that's going to be sort of given to us, will be more like an assessment year modifier, whatever those things were called that are, are minor, not minor, but small adjustments, as mentioned, and the ability to handle those versus the, the shock value that Kevin referenced. So, Brian, was that what you heard her say? Yeah, I'd agree, uh, Madam Reeve. I think that... Uh... Uh, I, I'm actually surprised that we haven't had something yet. Um, I, I guess I would hope by the 15th uh, next week that we would see something because she did indicate the first part of October. I think she actually said that. Yes. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and I, I agree. I think that, you know, from my perspective, the, the market value should be the one that determines it when it comes to the linear. And, and um, one of the models they talked about when we were in Lethbridge is that in Texas, they adjusted every three months. I, I don't know if that's doable. I think uh, I'd have to defer to Kevin and Matt to see how that works. But, um, you know, I think that's one of the suggestions that needs, she needs to hear perhaps if we do meet, irregardless of what um, comes out from her announcement in the next week or so and what it means for our budget. But I think that's the one thing that we have to base it on is, is you know, so that it doesn't cripple counties as far as what the actual value of that uh, facility is, is generating, whether it's today, whether it's where when oil was $140 a barrel or when the value was uh, when they were giving gas away. I mean, those are all relevant to the market conditions and what, what um, taxes is, are paid. So basing a market value assessment to me is a much, much fairer way to do it. And, I, and she knows that because we've talked about that, but I think reiterating that as a council is helpful, I think. Your mic is on. on. All right. Sorry about that. We'll keep uh, we'll keep the meeting with Minister Allard on the agenda, and the items uh, can continue to be massaged. Obviously, funding uh, taxation issues is, is something we would could talk to her about. Uh, what Brian just referenced. Um, so farmland might might come out in the discussion, but. Um, um, whether we want to recommend that it be looked at or not, I, I think she's already made it clear that they weren't going to be looking at farmland assessment. Brian? One of, one of the other things that was uh, a resolution that was brought up at AUMA that I was, I was, quite frankly, I think it would be delightful, is that the province takes over the, the school uh, uh, taxes, the school portion of collecting the taxes. You know that the, first of all, it takes our um, the unpaid taxes that some of the wells and, and uh, oil companies and other properties that aren't paying their taxes, at least the school portion, that, which is basically a flow through anyways, um, goes to the province. I mean, rather than them having to refund it like they did last year, this way it's just out of their pocket. It's 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 nothing to do with us. So I would like to I would like to add that to the discussion topics if possible because I think it is relevant and I know it, it can come forth as a resolution but if we have a discussion with her about it I don't think that's uh, I think that could you know send a message that we're trying to to see um, Kevin what do you think about not having to deal with school taxes <laughs> well I mean that's as long as I've been in the business that's been on the agenda for almost both provinces I've been in so I think uh, obviously it makes a lot of sense to uh, to get out of that business and let them let them deal with it 
Um, it has a lot of pluses, but the trouble with the province is they don't want to assume anything. They like to download, right? You don't see them upload a whole lot, so it, or you never do. So I think uh, it certainly makes sense. Um, and I was just going to quickly comment on the on the oil and gas component uh, as well. I mean, the province does those assessments, so everything's doable. They they can decide how they want to regulate it. Um, obviously, to my thinking, it should be done on sales. Uh, rather than the cost of equipment, uh, because that's that appears to be what the oil companies are balking at is, is they can't afford to pay the, you know, the 400 bucks per year, per kilometer of pipeline uh, to the municipality. Right, it needs to be down substantially. So, uh, I think that's certainly something they could do. But at the end of the day, I think oil and gas it needs to be treated fairly for the services that it requires, and that's what worries me with this model they proposed is, you know, we, we have 22,000 wells uh, or close to it. And if that's only going to be taxed at 10%, then you're providing service to 22,000 wells on a basis of 2,200 paying taxes. And those numbers just, I don't care who you are, they don't work. So uh, I sent the information to them uh, with regards to Saskatchewan and Manitoba and nobody's doing anything a whole lot different than we are, so. You sent it to Municipal Affairs, Kevin? I sent it to Gerald uh, because RMA is looking to do, I, I suggested that they do the, the detailed work behind the scenes on the fairness between jurisdictions. So there isn't the odd example that gets cherry picked and everything else gets ignored. Yes. Kevin mentioned that on September 1st at the Lethbridge meeting. <clears throat> so we have, uh, moving on to the environment and parks agenda, Kevin, um, do we need meetings since the information that you've received last week from Green or? Yeah, so my suggestion is that we don't need a meeting because we needed to find out whether or not a Water Act and a wetland um, compensation would be required in order to define the drain through the Bassano area, um, get the easements in place, whatever is needed. Uh, but by they've come back from the wetlands specialist and said that it will, it will require a wet Water Act approval and there will be compensation. So that'll be up to, from our previous discussions with council, that's up to the landowners. Uh, if, they're, if they wanna get rid of water on their land, that there's gonna be offsets that they're gonna have to pay for that, obviously, because that's part of the Water Act wetland component. And so I don't think there's any need because the determination is there based on policy. And I think that's all that we've asked. The great area before, obviously, was the EID system runs through there, right? And everywhere else, they define their drains and they make it flow. So why is this different? But they've come back and basically said that it is different and it needs to be dealt with. Even lowering the culvert, we would have to go through a wetland assessment. So that was the information we've been after. It took a long time. The suggestion of maybe meeting with the minister sped it up. I don't know, but... We did get the word back. Brian? Well, and you, you touched on one of the reasons that I think, uh, and it was expressed by actually uh, Minister Nixon too, is that the delay in some of these approvals. Um, so do you think that there's any value in meeting, meeting over just that issue? That why do these things take so long? I mean, we can go back to North Headgates, getting that approval. I mean, all these these approvals, it seems like we are held up for years. And I and you know, and I'm not trying to exaggerate because I mean we've all lived through this, and it seems like any time we deal with an environment or a water act approval, um, everybody throws up their hands and says, "Well, we got to wait two or three years before we get something done." And Minister Nixon, when he took on this portfolio, he, it was an expression that he made that he wanted to clean up some of this stuff. So I'd be curious to see where he's at as far as getting some of that done from my point of view. And I don't know whether you, I mean, you guys live this, you and Jeff live this day to day, um, Kevin, but uh, 
I'm just curious about your thoughts on that part of uh, meeting. And maybe he'll say, well, that's not enough of an agenda item to meet with, and that could very well be. But I just think that the delay in the, in the actual process is very frustrating. Yeah, I, I certainly think we could talk about red tape reduction. I think that's important for every department. Um, but I, I don't know if Jeff is on here, but I know that the, the new online approval system is quicker. It's not three years anymore. I think he can, can actually get something within a calendar year. <laughs> so whether that's good enough, uh, I'm not too sure. This particular case in Bassano, I honestly believe it's due to the fact that there is a legal case and the province is called into it, and, and I honestly believe that. So um, there's reasons why there's delays, because these delays aren't typical uh, with that particular thing. But I don't know if Jeff's on here or not, but if he is, he could certainly comment. But I know it is a lot quicker. The, the wetland component uh, is a lot quicker now with that online tool. But I think generally red tape reduction would be a good discussion for environment because it has the most red tape of anything, I think. <laughs> If we don't have a meeting and uh, he's available at the bear pit session, Brian, it would be a great question, great general question. So maybe we could do it there. I think that's an excellent idea. I don't want to take a meeting up for just the sake of one issue. I think it's productive to have more than one issue, unless it's a, an issue like the assessment model review that is the, the main focus of what we're dealing with. But so I, yeah, I would support that. I can certainly, um, if it's not expressed by somebody else or, or uh, somebody else within this room, um, we certainly can, I would certainly be willing to take that on. Because it is a good question and it's germane to the whole audience, not just the County of Newell. So we can uh, agree then to Nix, Nixon for a meeting. <laughs> I was waiting to say that. All right, and Rick McIver for Fisher Bridge. We already have a meeting date um, by a phone. So that one's on. And so the meetings are sorted out then. Ariana? Got yes, thank you. Perfect. Anything else in that, Clarence? When we say phone, is that how are we working that? Are we working that by telephone and through a conference call too yet? Or what, what do we mean by that? Ariana might know something about it, but it, it must be a conference telephone call. I missed the first part of that question. Was it about? The Rick McIver date, okay. it's uh, via telephone. Give me one second. So it's during November 4th, the final day of the convention. Yeah, it's, it's a webex a webex invite they sent me i'm gonna forward it to you guys after the fact but there's a it's just a phone number and a code for you to type in so probably as many of you just dial the number and join in on the phone so it's a conference call basically yes on that item All right, um, so item eight, seven, I guess at, at one o'clock or, I mean, we, it's close to noon. Do you want to break now and item eight, seven or eight, eight after Daphne gives her report? 